Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, the investigative journalist and author, Ian Williams, who's going to talk to us about Cambridge's relationship with overseas investors, and in particular with China. Ian Williams was foreign correspondent for Channel 4 News, based in Russia and then Asia. He then joined NBC News as Asia correspondent when he was based in Bangkok and Beijing. As well as reporting from China over the last 25 years, he's also covered conflicts in the Balkans, the Middle East and Ukraine. He won an Emmy and BAFTA awards for his discovery and reporting on the Serb detention camps during the war in Bosnia. His recent books include The Fire of the Dragon, China's New Cold War, and Every Breath You Take, China's New Tyranny, which features a company that has funded Cambridge University and has a contract with Cambridgeshire County Council. You'll be followed by Councillor Sam Davis. You're muted, but you can start putting questions via the chat function and there will be Q&A after the two speakers. So, Ian, over to you. Tony, okay, he's speaking. Yeah. All right, well, th thank you for that kind introduction, Wendy, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to speak with you all this evening. Um, I spent many years working in and around China, and my two recent books are, in many respects, a sort of product of that, of that period. Um, the first one, Every Breath You Take, the title of which I borrowed from the police, um, looks more at China surveillance, the surveillance state, um, cyber warfare, China tech, and indeed a lot of the China tech companies which we hear so much about, uh, which have caused an increasing amount of alarm to intelligence agencies and of which, of course, are very well represented in the Cambridge area. Um, the second book I wrote more recently is Fire of the Dragon, China's New Cold War, uh, which seeks to look more at China internationally and you know, what China has become under Xi Jinping, an increasingly hostile and aggressive state, and the, the, the many fronts in which it is pursuing what I've characterized as a, as a form of Cold War. Um, ranging from the South China Sea and Taiwan through to cyberspace and, and, the, and the Arctic. And one of the things that I've looked at in both of those books are the activities of the Chinese Communist Party within liberal democracies, in particular within academia, um, and the attempts really to impose themselves internationally. Um, I think what's happened over the last few years, we've seen a big change from uh, China, which was regarded, I think, be, well, I would say about a decade ago as being quite a, a benign country, something whose rise would be um, beneficial both to the Chinese people as the country became richer, possibly becoming more liberal, more open, um, and also internationally to the global economy. And I think that was epitomized by the golden era of, of Osborne and Cameron, um, which during which they described Britain as a, a, an aspiration to become China's best friend in the West. And I think that very much acted as almost a, a starting gun for many, many universities and university towns to go in pursuit of Chinese money um, in a manner where the due diligence has often reduced to counting the number of zeros on the check. And this, because of the changes we've seen over the last two or three years, a growing realization uh, that China is not the benign state that a lot of people thought it was, that it is becoming more belligerent, more hostile internationally. It has uh, produced a re-evaluation of, of where we stand with, with China in particular. Um, I use the shorthand here, China, but I have to say what I mean is the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I am very fond of China. I enjoyed my time in China. I think what is of concern to me is the focus of the book is the activities of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think the more we've seen, particularly since the beginning of um, the pandemic, 
whether it's the, the human rights abuses in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong, the, the increasing hostility across the Taiwan Strait and elsewhere, uh, what we've seen is a very different sort of China emerge and a lot of concern being expressed more recently uh, by those who have been dealing with China or have been closely watching the activities of the party. Now, I spent quite a lot of time looking at China and academia, and I focused quite strongly on Cambridge, and in particular on Cambridge University, um, because China has focused quite strongly on Cambridge. They focus a lot on academia in general. But the more I began to look at the activities of Communist Party, CCP-linked entities at the university, uh, the more I found myself going down all sorts of different rabbit holes, uh, in all sorts of different directions. And my investigations were not particularly helped by the university, which in terms of transparency, I've always found roughly on par with the Communist Party. Um, it's, they're not a very open organization, and the university seems to regard any inquiry about the nature of their um, funding, about the nature of their relationships with Communist Party links entities as some sort of gross intrusion on, acad on academic freedom. There is quite a shocking lack of transparency. Um, I think at the root of it, uh, universities these days are businesses. There's a lot of gullibility, there's a lot of greed, and I think there's a shocking lack of curiosity about the nature of some of the organizations and individuals that they're dealing with. Now, you may say that there's no such thing as clean money and, and universities, university towns take money from all sorts of people because it's in their interest to boost local economies, to create local jobs. But at the root of my concern is we need to know and understand and be aware about who these people are, where their money comes from, and what their intentions are. And if after ascertaining that, we still feel happy about taking their money, then fine. But there should be a process and there should be a transparency about who these people are and who we are inviting in and a, a more realistic understanding of their intention, uh, which is altogether not necessarily benign. I'll give you two or three examples um, of things I came across while I was researching the university. Um, one was a, a joint venture which the engineering department at Cambridge set up with, with the government of Nanjing, now, I had to delve down into all sorts of background papers and documentation from various oversight bodies to come across details of this. It's not openly available, um, but effectively the department took 10 million pounds from the government of Nanjing, the Chinese Communist Party, to set up a joint research center in, in that city, um, which is described as a smart city research center. And there were pictures on a, on a Cambridge University press release at the time of Stephen Toop, the then vice chancellor, shovel in hand, lined up beside a local Communist Party officials, all turning the ground for the uh, groundbreaking ceremony on, on that building. I mean, it looked like it could have been a, a handout from a sort of rather classic old Communist Party paper. Um, now, the problem with this, is that the university said, well, smart cities, the, 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 this is, these are technologies that will improve urban life for all of us, whether it's the environment, the way traffic flows, the frequency with which your garbage is collected. And, you know, I'm sure that smart city technology, which essentially boils down to sensors and cameras, um, may improve urban life in different ways. But in the Chinese context, it's all about surveillance, control, and security, um, the epitome of which we're seeing in, in Xinjiang, which has been turned into, quite a, turned into quite a terrifying police state. And 
the Cam that Cambridge is openly cooperating on a program like that with an organization which is garnering this technology for surveillance and control is quite shocking. And of course, we need to bear this in mind when we see local authorities here and in Cambridge talking about smart cities and the nature of the people that they're cooperating with on those smart city technologies. Another example you probably saw earlier this year was um, the, the opening of the Institute for Sustainability Leadership building in Cambridge, which was opened by King Charles earlier this year, um, a 12 and a half million pound refurbishment of the old post office. Half of that money came from a Chinese company called Envision, Envision which is described itself as a sustainable uh, green energy company. They build wind turbines mostly. Um, the guy that runs the company, that owns most of the company, is also a member of the National People's Congress, also a member of an advisory group to the party. He's also deputy head, or was not until recently, of the Thousand Talents Programme, which is regarded in the United States as uh, uh, little more than an espionage and um, cyber spying outfit who, who, whose job it is to recruit scientists to work in China. Now, you know, arguably, uh, to be a successful business person in China requires you to uh, cooperate with and engage with Communist Party entities. But again, it comes down to transparency. I mean, it may well be that none of this matters, that the money is the most important role. But None of this was uh, up front. None of this was mentioned in any of the documentation and the coverage of the opening of that centre. And I, I think that the university and those behind the centre owe it to the residents of Cambridge, to the students and to the staff to be very clear about who it is they're taking money from. Um, if having looked at the credentials of that person, then we feel comfortable about taking the money, then fine, but it should be clear and it should be open about the links that some of these individuals and companies have. A couple of other examples, um, Tencent uh, made a big investment in the engineering department for quantum computing. Again, the engineering department put out a press release which described Tencent as a company that was enriching the online and digital life of, of, of Chinese people. Well, yes, it may well be doing that, but it also, through their app, is an instrument uh, of surveillance, control, and disinformation within China and abroad. And to me, it's quite shocking that where there have, the, have been these tie-ups, and Jesus College Cambridge is another example, with their China Center and Dialogue Center, the wording with which they've described these entities is lifted directly from Communist Party handouts rather than any objective um, analysis of what these organizations stand for. Another example is, is the Science Park in, in Cambridge, which is a joint, which is owned by the university, but is a joint venture with Tus Park, which is an offshoot of Xingdao University in, in, in China. Um, which has been at the forefront of a crackdown on academic freedom, uh, something which they don't openly advertise. Now, maybe we don't mind about that. Maybe the important thing is getting their money, but we should know about it. It should be clear um, who these people are. The Science Park is being wired. It is being given a 5G network by Huawei. Now, the government has barred Huawei from participation in the UK national 5G network or, or for national security reasons. So should we not ask why, therefore, they're deemed worthy to setting up a 5G network on the, on the Cambridge Science Park, which will hopefully they consist of cutting edge companies um, making and developing cutting edge technologies. Now, these are just really just scratching the, the surface of, of a number of the things that I discovered while I was researching my books. And I think that there are a number of lessons that, that come out of this and a number of things that we need to be aware of when we're dealing with 
um, Chinese companies. It's very easy to say, well, these are private companies, but from my experience, there is no such thing as a private company in the Chinese context. Uh, Huawei, for instance, I would regard very much as being an instrument of state power uh, as a, a branch of the Communist Party. You cannot exist in China without very close links to the party. The party determines whether as a business you, you, you thrive or you die. And Huawei is very much a champion of the Chinese state internationally. You may have noticed last month in, in the United States the arrest of all the indictments. Uh, they, they weren't arrested because they're back in China, the, but the indictments against two Chinese intelligence officials, intelligence officers who are accused of attempting to bribe officials at the Justice Department who were investigating Huawei um, one of a number of different cases against the company um, currently going through um, the US courts. Now, I think that it's important to, to me, certainly, that when we talk about a lot of these companies, whether it's Huawei, Hikvision, Tencent, that we understand the relationship that they have with the Chinese state and with the Chinese Communist Party. I think what's also important is to have a, a, a better grasp of the intentions and the purpose sometimes that is behind a lot of the Chinese investment and the Chinese, um, the, the, the way they go about exerting their influence and spending their money. Uh, there's an organization within China called the United Front Works Department, which kind of conjures up a picture of, of little municipal workers in high-vis jacket, jackets digging holes in the road. Um, it's much more sinister than that. It, it's, it's an important branch of the, the intelligence services in China. They work very closely with the People's Security Bureau. It's the original idea of United Front work was often, often attributed to Lenin, but it was taken up with gusto by Mao. And Xi Jinping has massively expanded and funded the UFWD um, in, in what he and Mao have described as, as a, a magic, magic weapon. And the purpose of the of the organization is, is to spread influence, is to unite you know, the idea of united front, is to build relationships with organizations and individuals who are outside the immediate remit of the Communist Party. And they operate um, a large network internationally, um, particularly targeting academics and business and others whom the party regards as being useful and whose um, support, passive or openly, uh, the party would regard as being useful to, to spread their word, to spread, spread the word of the party or to at least be supportive uh, of its aims. And I think that without wanting to sound like a sort of a conspiracist, I think the way that the, 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 the Chinese, the, Communist Party operates, especially through organizations like the UFWD, is quite methodical. You know, they're very good at targeting um, people they wish to influence and organizations, particularly in academia and business, who they regard as being important um, or technologies they regard as being um, important to further China's own technological development. Um, it's, you know, on the one hand, you've got quite aggressive cyber espionage, but why spy when you can ask people to give it to you, uh, which is more frequently what we see, what we see happening. Now, I think that when we look at it in the, in the context of, of China, I think there's a sense that, ch that, that, that Chinese entities see Cambridge as a very a uh, useful repository uh, of technology and influence. Um, I think there's no accident that a company called that a company like Huawei is looking to set up its um, uh, one billion pound technology technology research center 
um, in Silicon Vale in, in Cambridge. I don't think it's any accident that other Chinese companies see, see Cambridge as, a, as, a, as a, a, a welcoming place and somewhere where they um, want to invest and where they want to build influence. Now, why this matters, I think it matters for several reasons. Um, first of all, there is the, the moral and the ethical argument. Um, should we be doing business with companies, entities, organizations, which are tainted with human rights abuses, uh, whether this is in Xinjiang, where a lot of Chinese technology companies um, operate, this includes Huawei, it includes Hikvision, where they provide a lot of the um, surveillance and other equipment to the Chinese Communist Party with whom they work extremely closely. Um, do we want to work with entities like this? Um, as I say, perhaps, perhaps the answer is what's new. We, 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 we work with all sorts of, it, it's not unusual for universities um, to, uh, or indeed uh, others to, to take money um, from thugs or kleptocrats. Uh, but we deserve to know, we deserve to understand where these companies come from and who they are. Now, the second issue, which is, of course, concern, which is more directly to do with the university, is one of academic freedom. The, the extent to which un the universities or different departments within the university are compromising their own academic freedom, their own subjects about which they will discuss in order to maintain links, research tie-ups, or, or student numbers um, because of an over-dependence on, on Chinese money. Now, we've seen this in, in my research most blatantly with, with Jesus College at Cambridge, with the China Centre and the Dialogue Centre there, um, both of which were very much products of the golden era, and in my opinion, set up not so much to pursue academic excellence, but to court Chinese business, and which for many years not only uh, parroted um, CCP talking points, but actively avoided um, discussing or analyzing any issues, whether it be Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang, human rights, which would be seen to be uh, um, offensive or hurting to, to, the, to their Chinese partners. And it's only recently after a number of internal investigations at Jesus College uh, that they have um, reformed those different bodies within the, within the college uh, in an attempt to restore some credibility and in an attempt to broaden the, the way they examine um, events and, and, and policies and aspects of China. Um, then I think, and this is where I, I, I broaden it out more with, with, with other aspects of Cambridge, and in fact, with some of your own dealings with organizations and, 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 and companies, is you have several practical issues, I think, and th which we need to be aware, of, aware with when we're examining some of these tie-ups. The first is, is security. It's the, it's the security of the, of the tech. It's the security um, and of the relationships that are, being, that are being built. Now, when we talk about 5G, for instance, um, the ability of technologies not only to um, spy, to garner data, um, and possibly in, in the event of a, a breakdown in relations with, with China, uh, of possibly sabotage. And the, these are all concerns which the intelligence agencies have, and you've probably noticed over recent months, um, interventions by the heads of MI6, MI5, GCHQ, which have increasingly uh, uh, an increasing urgency about them in pointing out the potential dangers from from Chinese technology and some and, and tie ups um, with adva in advanced technologies. And I think one of the reasons why 
uh, the heads of these organizations have broken cover in recent months is because of a real concern they have that it's not being taken sufficiently seriously, um, particularly by business, particularly by academia, and also in some, in some political circles. Um, and I think that, for, for instance, if, if you look at an issue like smart cities, how secure is the data? It, it, it's, a, it's a fairly fundamental thing that perhaps doesn't initially come to mind when you're talking about tie-ups with, with, with various organizations or companies that have links with China or the Chinese Communist Party. But you, I mean, I don't know anybody remembers that movie a few years ago, The Italian Job, which was, a, 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 it was not a high-tech movie, but in order to pull off a heist, uh, the bad guys the managed to, um, I seem to remember, to, to black out the security cameras in Turin, was it? It was, it, it was set in order to, um, to, to, to enable their heist. And it, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. In fact, this was, the, the movie itself was even cited by the technical director of GCHQ when he um, gave a warning a few months ago about the, 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 the safety and the, uh, of um, Chinese security cameras and other smart city tech, the sort of sensors and cameras, which uh, were increasingly being used by local authorities and other uh, others around Britain, then it's not only the immediate danger that perhaps um, these it, the, the, this kit uh, could be sabotaged or could be used in a malign way should circumstances change, but it's also the power of the data itself, um, the way in which it, it enables the person with control or the organization with control of that data to map the way a city operates, to map the way a city lives, to map the way people within those cities live. The, there are all sorts of implications about the use and abuse of data, uh, which really need to be quite seriously addressed, especially if you're dealing with organizations which potentially could turn hostile and which are in many respects an arm of an increasingly hostile state. Now, the other practical uh, side of this is the whole notion of overdependence. Uh, we've seen with Russia uh, the, the danger of overdependence on, on hydrocarbons, on oil, on gas, and the impact that has had, particularly on, on Western Europe, um, and the knock-on effect on the UK. And until very recently, there was an, uh, an argument that said we need to engage further with Vladimir Putin. The way of taming Putin is to be nice to him. Um, to a, and, and this was uh, an argument made by seemingly sensible people until not long before the Ukraine war. Now, the, the dependence upon China in, in numerous ways is far, far more su substantial than it ever was on Russia. And China has shown that it will not hesitate to use issues of trade, issues of investment, issues of market access um, for, as means of coercion. It, we've seen it in, in the case of Australia, uh, after the Australians asked for an independent investigation into the origins of COVID. We've seen it in Lithuania, after the Lithuanians um, had the audacity to allow Taiwan to open a, a consulate or open a diplomatic presence in their own name. We saw it hinted at here uh, the other day after that appalling abduction and beating in the Manchester consulate the Chinese consulate in Manchester, where a Hong Kong protester was dragged inside and, and beaten, in, including by uh, diplomats. Um, appallingly, no action has yet been taken, although we believe it's being investigated. And while it was, the Chinese embassy in London made an extraordinary, I wouldn't call it a press conference because it was more of a statement, on, on camera statement, um, 
pushing back against the criticism, uh, but also making the point that uh, hinting that trade relations could be affected um, if, if the British government um, were to take any sort of action against Chinese diplomats. Now, the, the, this leads us to this, this broader issue of, of the nature of dependency and a city like Cambridge, which has a large presence of Chinese companies and where there is a high dependence in the university on Chinese students and Chinese academic tie-ups. Now, leaving aside the potential um, security issues there, I would argue that it's really dangerous to create dependencies, whichever country you're talking about, which means that you come to rely on the income from a certain group of students or a certain um, type of acad academic tie-up. Now, I'm sure that the vast majority of Chinese students play an important role in university life and make a valuable contribution to the university. But I would caution against any sort of over-dependence because I think that potentially that is very, very dangerous and, and could um, come back to create damage in the future. Uh, we are seeing a, a rapidly worsening state of, of relations with China, um, attempts to salvage it somewhat at the G20 meeting this week. But it's, hard, it's not difficult to envisage a situation where um, there are, that, that, that relations worsen, um, that you get uh, an accelerated decoupling by both sides economically. Um, and in the event, for instance, of, a, of an invasion or an attempted evasion of Taiwan, uh, that would almost certainly trigger sanctions. And then you, you, ha you have uh, a situation where this sort of dependency could be very, very damaging and, and very dangerous. Um, but to come back to the broader point, which I think is important for Cambridge more, more, more in general, as well as the university, is, it's, it is one of transparency and openness, because I think that it may well be that uh, we shouldn't, maybe, maybe we're being over choosy, maybe I'm being over critical about the nature of investments from uh, entities which are linked with the Chinese Communist Party and are now deeply embedded in Cambridge University and in Cambridge more generally. Um, maybe uh, the, the, the pursuit of cleaner money and, and relationships with people less tainted is a little too idealistic. And maybe there is an argument to say that no money is clean money. And, and, and it, but I think fundamentally, we need to understand where the money is coming from and the nature of these organizations and companies and their relationships. We need transparency about that in order to understand who they are, in order to understand what their motives are. To, in order to understand what their background and relationships are. And this is something which has not been forthcoming. And we need that transparency. And in, in the, the end of the day, once we've looked at that and once we've had that, then, you know, fine. If we still feel comfortable in taking that investment and that money, then so be it. But I think fundamentally, we need transparency in order to understand who these organizations are. We need it more than ever. And I think that over the years, especially during this period, this golden era, as it was called, these issues were, were simply um, swept under the carpet. It was as if almost it didn't matter. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish because we could maybe do a little more in the Q&A, but with one example, which is not Cambridge, but it, it does illustrate a wider point. There's a Chinese shipping company called Costco state-owned, uh, own lots of ships and ports and other, and they, they've just been allowed to buy, very controversial in Germany, a stake of a port in uh, the Hamburg port. Earlier in, in Greece, they bought um, part of uh, Piraeus port, in, in, and they've now got a majority stake in that in, in, in Greece. And I did a lot of digging at the time when that went through, 
um, the Greeks are having second thoughts now because the investment's not gone in there and there's all sorts of accusations of environmental damage and an investment, promised investment that didn't happen, which is another story which I could go into and it's quite a frequent one. But it, it turned out that, that Costco were coming in and, and quote unquote saving Piraeus Port that was deeply indebted. And it was deeply indebted. But when you looked at the accounts, Costco was 10 times more leveraged and indebted than the Greek port. But it, it didn't matter because the investment, because it was a state backed company and the purpose was not commercial primarily, it was strategic. It was because it was important to the party to create these nodes, these ports. So I think we need to understand that a lot of the money that comes in, a lot of the investment that's being made is not necessarily being made for strictly commercial reasons. The organizations and the entities often have a more strategic purpose, and that purpose is frequently aligned with the interests of the Chinese Communist Party and a broader sense of what is important to them, what technologies they need to acquire, what footholds strategically they need to acquire. And I would just finish by saying that, you know, Cambridge is quite a prize. Cambridge is the host of Britain's leading university. Cambridge is the host of world-class technology startups. Um, Cambridge is an important city globally. Uh, and the companies that are drawn here, especially from more hostile countries, um, frequently have purposes which are rather broader than, than, than merely a, a successful investment. And I will, on that point, maybe hand it, hand it back to you, Wendy. Thank you very much, um, Ian. So um, that's a fantastic talk. And um, we're going to pull some of those together. There's a lot of issues in there that were really interesting. Um, and I think are going to correlate also with some of the issues that Sam Davis is going to pick up. 